while we work on getting one, uh, we will continue with the programming. So if you have suggestions for us, we'd be glad to hear them. Uh, oh, our uh, next program will be December 7th. Uh, Bill Levin and Trails has had an annual downtown uh, historic walk. And this year, we are partnering with them, also the Downtown Association. And Jeff Smith will be leading the tour from Walston Park. It'll start at 2 o'clock. Our speaker tonight is Mark Fitzwater. And he is a training officer, right, for the fire department and their in-house historians. And he has a lot of pictures and, and good stories to share with us. So please welcome Mark. start getting quiet, just raise your hand in the back and I'll try to, to speak up. Um, I grew up with the fire service. Um, actually, my dad is sitting over there uh, in the back. <laughs> yeah, put your hand. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I, that's where I got my interest in the history of Lebanon, uh, the stories and hearing about uh, the firefighters in the past. And, you know, some of them kind of become legendary as, as you get older. And uh, then when I got on full time, I started as a volunteer and 2002, as soon as I was out of high school, and you now I'm in the training division and get to train new folks that come on, and things are good. So, uh, what I want to do tonight is just share with you what I know about the history of Lebanon. And there's a lot, and things have changed. And if one of you in the crowd finds something that you would like to talk to me about, please come up to me afterward, and I'll try to get that fixed if it's something you know is inaccurate. Because I kind of where I get all my information from is I delve into the archives of our um, Lebanon Express quite a bit, uh, the archives of Lebanon Fire District, our old um, log books, and then a lot of the old historical information that we have that is uh, still stored at the station. Uh, so any additional info, in fact, a uh, gentleman back Dave just recently gave me some info that we're able to kind of pinpoint where the original fire station was, and I mean that's that's a big deal because for the longest time find where that was. And everybody I talked to had no idea. There's no pictures, there's no accounts of it. And of course, when you go back to that time, everybody just called the fire department. Well, you know where the fire department is. They didn't throw an address on it. And so it made it really hard. So, But I think we finally have narrowed that, that piece of it down. And I'll get there on the, my presentation. What was the date of the original? Oh, 1884. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so, um, Community leaders got together. Actually, it was uh, March 12th, and they wanted to have a city meeting about developing <coughs> a fire department. And so they got together at the Charleston Hotel. Um, that sat on Main Street uh, by Ash, I believe it was. And so they had a community meeting, and in that meeting they decided to form engine company number one. Um, it was a private entity. It wasn't owned by the city at that time. Uh, it was completely funded by uh, dues, so they had to pay 25 cents a month, a month for membership, and at the time it was quite a bit, and there was a lot of grumbling about having to pay to get on. Um, to be selected to be on the, on the department, you had to know somebody in the department and get um, them to sponsor you, essentially say, I know this guy, he's going to be a great fireman, let's bring him on. And then they went through the process of called the blackball system. Has anybody ever heard that? You know, the, the, I've been blackballed. Uh, that's where they would take around a box and they had a white and a black ball. And if you got so many black balls, I believe it was three in the bylaws, then unfortunately you were not selected to be with the fire department. And that went up to all the members as they would pass it around during volunteer drill. And so this was. The earliest photo I know of, the Lebanon Fire District, there was some argument whether this was actually us, but we did have a engine. And this would be, this is a hand pump. And so what they would do is they would hook into a hydrant, or at that time they had wells. And the wells ran up and down Main Street, and they had an area where they could connect to those hydrants. And at early times, those wells, those hydrants on those wells, were uh, all private, made by the city at that time. And um, they hook into that and they could pump and push pressure with that. Um, they didn't upgrade the water system uh, for quite a while, it was the 1890s until they upgraded the water system. And they gauged it on being able to supply four hose lines and 
pump 60 feet in the air with those hose lines. That was kind of interesting. That was the gauge that they used. They had to be able to pump those four lines with 60 feet, or 60 feet in the air. And so this is actually a picture, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this one, of our host team uh, in front of the Donica House, which still stands today, over off 2nd Street, uh, by the old post office. Um, and they competed all over the place. They completed in Corvallis, Portland, um, doing hot postcard polls. And our team was really good. Um, there was a lot of uh, competition. And uh, reading some of the articles with us in Albany, it got a little bit heated at times. But uh, you know, they always worked through it. Um, our first official fire chief was Walt Peterson, right here. And uh, he got into, he's one of those early pioneer firemen. Uh, and he ran livery feed and uh, stables. But uh, we had a bunch of early pioneer firemen. So if you like read, if you read the actual minutes, I mean, there's still see names on there like Ralston. We had uh, John Ralston. He was the son of Jeremiah Ralston, who was the founder of our town. And uh, he was the original secretary for the fire department when we wrote our initial bylaws. Um, you'll see names like Elkins. Uh, a lot of the names that you'll see streets named after <coughs> were members of our department. It was a very social, uh, it was almost a social club, really. I mean, it was, you, you got to the fire department, you made connections, and you met people. There, the bell. All right, so this bell, uh, every time you drive by uh, our station on uh, 1050 West Oak Street, this bell is still sitting there. Uh, this bell we purchased as an apartment in uh, 1884, and it actually was purchased in Philadelphia. They took it by cart and then by boat all the way down around South, South America and then brought it all the way up to Port or Portland and then brought it by, uh, by uh, road or uh, coach to Lebanon. And then it was installed between Ash and Vine Street on an 18 foot pillar. And so uh, what they would do if we had a fire rang out, they did have a night watchman. But most of the time, if there was a fire, any citizen could run up and ring that bell. Um, continuous ringing meant there was a fire, and that would alert everybody to the fire. And so at that time, you gotta think, Lebanon wasn't that big. So really, the core of people were right around Main Street. And I think the census back then, if I remember right, was about a little over 200 people. And so, of course, it's going to alert them and they're going to come in. And so, like I said, this bell still sits today. At some point in time, unfortunately, it looks like it has dropped, but uh, it's alive and well. And what's interesting is, so we purchased the same type of bell from the same company for our station out at Wyrick, and we got a discount for being a second time for this <laughs> <laughs> It's like zero, 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 three. Um, this is a certificate, uh, this is uh, original membership, and this is kind of what the cards look like. We actually had two of them, uh, two different types of certificates. This is a little bit later one, uh, but if you come down the fire hall in our main uh, lounge area, we have one of the original fire chief, which was uh, Walt Peterson, or Douglas C. Peterson. Um, which is all the way back. He was a charter member, so 1884. So pretty cool to have. This one's for Vernon Reed, so we'll talk a little about um, him later. And actually, speaking of Vernon Reed, this is him right here, number four in. Uh, so June 14, uh, 1914, is when Lebanon Engine Company number one officially moved from being a private entity where the city took over. And at that point in time, we were able to claim all the buckets and every, all the ladders that the city owned at that point, and uh, the fire department was officially under them. Um, still competed in the uh, hose uh, competitions and stuff like that, but uh, yeah, we were officially city department. Uh, at that point, it was all hand pulled. Everything was hand pulled. There was no no motorized vehicles at this point. Uh, you know, you think about uh, the pictures of them with horses pulling the large steamers. We never had a steamer. The only things that I can find that we had is we had two hose carts that looked just like this, and then we had um, just that hand pumper. And the hand pumper, as what I can find, didn't last long. I read an article or a, a 
log where they said that the wheels were no good on it. And I'm guessing that's about the time that it went out of service. Another thing that's interesting too is one of our older members, and he's passed away now, uh, Albert Smith couldn't recall ever us having a hook, any kind of uh, hand cart. But that would have been before his time, because it was all the way back in the 1890s when that thing went out of service. You know, everything was made of wood, so it didn't quite last as long, especially getting drug behind a bunch of men pulling it through, you know, the streets of it. <clears throat> All right. So this is an interesting one I have a letter I found in here. This is the complete resignation of the Lebanon Fire District, or Lebanon Firefighters. And it's signed by Robert L. Gilson. And at the time, uh, this is 1918, they were still pulling carts. And there were vehicles out there. There were, you know, engines were out there. And we're still pulling carts. They were getting really frustrated with that. And so what they wanted, if they're not going to buy a fire truck, well, then you need to increase our rates. So somewhere in the early teens, they went from the members having to pay the department to the department having to pay the members. And they got so much money for each run that they did. They got so much money for going to drill. Um, and they got so much money for the fires that they attended. At that time, if you didn't show up to a fire, you had to have an excuse. You had to have a very valid excuse or you would get fined for not coming to the fire. And so um, with this, they essentially, what they wanted was they wanted seven coats that were waterproof and they wanted their dues increase. And fortunately, they were able to settle it out and the city kept the fire department on. So they were kind of an important thing to have. <laughs> and so finally we got our motorized equipment. So under Chief Robert Gilson, uh, they finally purchased three vehicles. Uh, the one on the far left is our international hose, hose cart. And uh, that's what we loaded all the hose on. It's still at station, actually it's at station 34 right now, and we're in the process so we're gonna get it cleaned up and remodeled. Um, and get it looking good again. But it's kind of rare to get to keep your original piece of motorized equipment, and that is it. That's the first piece of equipment the department bought. Uh, the second is our chemical wagon. And so you can see in the center, there's a big tank right there. It's a 60-gallon tank. And uh, what it was is it was a sodium bicarbonate uh, acid uh, tank. And so you'd mix the sodium bicarb with the acid, and then it would pressurize the tank, and they would use that to extinguish fires. And so what that worked really good for is if they got a really small fire, they could show up, knock it out before it became a big fire. In those days, they didn't have all the plastics and everything that burned like they did. Everything was natural fiber. So fires took a little bit longer to get going than they do today with all the plastics. Um, the max speed of that rig was 35 miles per hour. So it was pretty quick for its day. And uh, I believe in the center on that rig is uh, Albert Smith. And we'll talk about him later when we get presentation on the program. All right, so the article's kind of, kind of, kind of sad. Uh, that's Chief Gilson on the far left there. And uh, Chief Gilson unfortunately passed away suddenly, completely unexpected. Uh, they found him out he was uh, breaking or uh, using a hoe and working in his garden and just died suddenly. Nobody had any idea. They found him out in front of his yard. Relatively younger, I think he's in his early 50s when he passed away. Um, but uh, his son, actually, Mervyn Gilson, uh, took over as fire chief after he died. Um, and the year, that was 1928 when uh, Chief Gilson died. But he was a really big part of the department. Uh, he got our first motorized equipment. Uh, he helped make the move from um, talking with uh, Dave in the back. Uh, our original department, our original station, so when they first were established, they would uh, have their meetings essentially wherever they could. They didn't have any fire hall. They had their equipment spread all around town. Um, and when the fire would come in, they'd collect it and go to the fire. Uh, they finally, the city purchased the Masonic Lodge uh, Hall once they sold it, and it sounds like for $500. And they moved the fire engine house into there. And that's where they responded from, from 1886 to 1912. And I was able to find in 1912, they moved the station and they built uh, the original station, or a portion of it, uh, 
over on Maple Street, where our current city hall is. And so, when you say the Masonic Hall, you mean the Masonic Hall that there across from Wells Park? No, not anymore. No, the Masonic Hall that was purchased uh, was condemned after they okay. moved out in 1912. Yeah, so, no, it's not there anymore. And uh, what we were, we were trying to pinpoint exactly where the location that was. So it was somewhere in the vicinity, it's, they say Block 2, south of Tangent Street Gate. And so it's kind of like, uh, yeah. but it's completely gone. And so this is believed to be an early picture of the initial construction of uh, our station over on uh, Maple Street. And I thought this was just kind of an interesting picture. This is a 19, uh, early 1930s picture of uh, Lebanon. And you can kind of see, you can see, I threw in some, so you can see this is airport, this is 34 tangent. Oops, sorry, no, that was one over. But you can see pretty much everything was right localized around uh, Main Street. And at this time, our apparatus didn't go out of city limits. So all the rigs, when you had, there was a fire out in the country, they didn't respond. Um, the idea was, and I actually even read an article of the chiefs that said, if they're not willing to live in town, then they're not our responsibility because they're not paying taxes for our service. And so they looked at it negatively, which is kind of interesting at the time, because now that just seems so cold blooded. <laughs> so, but that, that's the way that they looked at it. And that you start thinking about those older rigs didn't quite have the capabilities. I mean, these roads weren't paved. These were old, these were mud roads, especially in the winter. They weren't, they weren't made necessarily for travel very well. In fact, it wasn't until the 1910s where Lebanon finally started paving Main Street. And so, and so in the 1930s is when we saw our first pumpers. Uh, there were a couple things that led up to that. Uh, it's actually moving towards the pumper. So the first large fire that we had was in 1891, and it was the post office. Uh, there was a, it was the Peebler store and had a, just installed a new jimmy into their um, building, and they started, they got a attic fire. And the attic fire spread over to the post office, completely burned off the post office. And at that time, that was the largest fire that Lebanon uh, had ever had, and that was right downtown. Um, they recall on that one that firefighters actually working the pumps for our hydrant system were getting burned as they were working the pumps. Um, so it was a pretty significant fire, the first one that they had really dealt with. Uh, the next fire that was the largest was, of course, the cannery fire in 1928. Uh, the cannery uh, burnt completely down, and it also burnt the planing mill and two residences. It was an entire city block. And after that fire, that's when the talk started coming out, we, we need to buy a pumper that we can actually flow water. Because understand, at that point, they had moved completely to hydrant pressure. So they were solely working off of the water that was provided from the city pumps to try to put out fire. They had nothing else. And uh, then the final straw was they had a gymnasium fire at the high school. And that's when they decided it's time that we get a committee together and we purchase an engine. And this is the 19... Uh, 36 C grade, um, and it was the first pumping piece of apparatus that we had, and it could push 1,000 gallons per minute. And so, not too far after that, uh, we got our first full time firefighters. Um, on the right, you see is Ed Lanster. So, the first full time firefighters were uh, Al Temple and uh, Ed Landstrom and uh, George Smith. And they all worked different shifts. And um, essentially, what was interesting is the volunteers were very, they were pretty much in charge of the department at that time. And so they were bringing on full time staff. Well, the worry was is that now that we have full time staff, they're going to jump in the engine and they're going to the door, we're not going to get to go. And so the responsibility of the full time staff was to maintain the apparatus, maintain the cleanliness of the station, and take the last rig out of the door. <laughs> so our thoughts are a little different today. It's usually just as soon as you get the door, the door. But um, things were a little different back then. Uh, the old station we actually had a fire pole, and uh, I missed that. But there it is. So after uh, those gentlemen moved on, so at that time they were paid about two hundred twenty-five dollars a month, 
and it didn't tend to keep guys employed very long, so they kind of moved on. And so with that, you uh, had a lot of turnover for the full-time staff. Um, this one, I really like this picture. This is uh, George Wilcox. He's doing a uh, the inhalator, is what the, the piece of equipment there is, but demonstrating for the Boy Scouts at that time. And uh, the inhalator was new, uh, innovative, and was supposed to help with resuscitated people. It would, the idea was that it would excite the airways and they would start breathing again. There was no cardiopulmonary resuscitation. They weren't doing compressions. They would put that on, they would hold it, and they would breathe, and if they started breathing again, then it worked. Um, about that time, they were having a lot of drownings, too. Um, you can kind of see the boat here. In the 1950s, there was a lot of uh, drownings up and down the San Diego River, and so uh, that was kind of coinciding with the purchase of the, uh, the ventilator that they had. And so I figured just in lines of it being Halloween, I got this story just because it's kind of, kind of interesting. So um, this gentleman right here is Blue Beach. And if you ever spend much time around the fire department, we pick on each other a lot. You know, it's, it's fun, you know, to, to kind of poke at each other. And so of course, um, Blue would poke at the other guys, they'd poke at him. Well, his joke was that when he'd leave, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to haunt you guys. And so, <clears throat> Anyway, um, Lou was there from 1949, or was it 48, to 1967. And uh, at the old station, they think that they used to hear him. And so he loved driving that sea grave that I showed you a picture of. And so it'd be parked in the bay while they'd go to bed at night in the morning and be moved up a foot. <laughs> and uh, then they did things like they'd be laying in their beds at night. And there was old wooden stairs that go up to the to the second story, and they'd hear clunk, clunk, clunk up the stairs. Well, yeah. nobody'd ever open the door. And they'd be sitting there, you know, laying in bed listening. And I heard this from a few of the firemen during the, the early 70s. And they you know, had the same thing happen to them. In fact, uh, Chief Larry Arnold even told me that one night he's laying there, and it sounds like somebody they had a little med room uh, closet, and it sounded like somebody was in there moving stuff around. And he said. So I got up and was like, this is weird. He said, he opens the door and there's all the equipment on the ground. Like, no one did. <laughs> so anyway, that's just, I, I, my guess is it's just the fire. Not the fire. It's like the whole story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a lie. And so here's a picture of all the apparatus um, from the early 1950s right here. Yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful pictures. They got a 47 C grade later on. Um, sitting right next to this is a blue. But yeah, um, and at that point in time, they started working uh, with the outlying areas to create a uh, fire district. Um, what that would mean is that all the farms and all the areas that got the mills would pay for fire service. And now they were getting rigs like this one here, um, where they would be able to uh, spawn out to the rural. Uh, what was interesting about this particular rig is they were purchasing this out of bed. And uh, they had sent this, they had the sales rep was supposed to take this rig to the to Lebanon. Well, uh, Albany's rig showed up, but his never did. And so, where's our rig? And come to find out that there was a uh, incident in, blinking on the name of it, but it's right over here. Oh, Vanport. <coughs> Vanport, stuff like Portland. Yeah. He had family there, and they were having massive flooding, so he was worried about them. So he literally didn't say anything to anybody and just took the fire truck up to the van. <laughs> and it just gone. So it took a while, but they eventually got a hold of him and he finally brought his stuff back. So they're, they're into that. So they're made it back to the station. And the station that you're looking at, um, if you were standing on Main Street in front of City Hall, it'd be right down Maple Street. And that's where we're looking at right now. And that's where the apparatus are coming off. And that's the dinette, actually, on the left there. They had a pretty good fire. Um, they were able to stop. Um, the chief at this time, in the early 1950s, was Eleanor Fitzgerald, right here. And just a few pictures. I just like the, uh, how they, you know, you, you think about what we wear today. And you know, I just brought an example of, you know, I put this on. I put these on. Look what they're wearing. 
they're showing up in their jeans and t-shirts and that's how they bought fire. And you'll see what they're using is they're using a high pressure fog nozzle. So now, now what we'll use, it's all about the gallonage, water puts out fire. Back then they were just using high expensive uh, fog nozzles. The idea is that steam expands and puts the fire out. And they must have been fairly successful. They just blow fire. Yeah, those poor guys. That's hot. <laughs> when you're guarding yourself. And this I thought was really interesting. So we uh, were able to get a civil defense rig. It was during uh, civil defense was real, really important. About between 1941 is when it was established. I believe it was they, they stopped it in the early 90s. Um, but uh, the idea was it was during the Cold War times post-World War II, where we were about nu nuclear war. And so, of course, you can see all the training videos out there. Well, anyway, um, we acquired one, and that's Jack Solstead um, in the center there. And uh, he was uh, also worked at times as a, he was a part-time firefighter, he was a full-time firefighter, kind of went back and forth. Um, but anyways, he took this rig down to the Yucca Flats in uh, Nevada during the atomic testing. So I had never heard that. You know, I'd been on the department for I think, 13 years, and I had never heard that we sent a rig down to Nevada to participate in the initial atomic class. That's kind of cool um, that they did that. And he was really big uh, during the civil defense. They did a lot of training for uh, urban search and rescue, and uh, really kind of giving the uh, fire department the tools they needed to help citizens locally. It's a good program. <coughs> Um, at that time, uh, Chief uh, Vernon Reeves took over uh, in place of Elmer Smith, or Elmer, Elmer Fitzgerald, excuse me. Um, he had a lot of impact for the fire department. I bring him specifically for that. Uh, he was the one who worked with Elmer to get additional full-time firefighters. Uh, at that time, they brought on, when he left, by the time he left, they had brought on a assistant chief, a second assistant chief. Um, really built the resources of the department up. And I guess I was blown away by how many civic groups this gentleman was part of. It's incredible. I don't know how he kept it all straight. Yeah. He hadn't been busy all the time. But uh, he was the last volunteer fire chief of Lebanon. So um, after he left, Mr. Uh, uh, Robertson, Paul Robertson took over. And uh, it's interesting, Paul Robertson, actually, uh, his granddaughter works for us now, Candace. <laughs> if any of you know Candace uh, McCurran, she's uh, his granddaughter. But uh, Paul actually was important in getting us um, the uh, ambulance service. I'll talk about that in a few seconds. This is kind of a little bit cut off, but uh, this is uh, really when the left of the home fire station started. So the home fire station, um, was initially its own little department, uh, but what triggered it was, so in 1961, on the cutoff drive, um, this little poor little guy, uh, Bobby Penner, um, they had a house fire out there. Uh, Mom was down in the kitchen, all of a sudden started seeing smoke coming down the stairs. And so she screamed for the girls, and uh, the kids to come down the stairs. They had four kids. Um, Two girls made it down the stairs. The little boy, the, the, his little older brother, uh, made it down the stairs, but he didn't show up. And so by that point, they're getting heavy smoke coming down the stairs. And so the husband went running up the stairs, and by that point in time, <clears throat> the smoke is down to the ground, and that's there's nothing to breathe in that. I mean, it's, it's smoke. It, the smoke is what kills you. It's, it's high temperature, high heat. And so he went up upstairs. He found Bobby. Um, grabbed him, wrapped him in a blanket, and threw him on the bed. His idea was that he was going to go out the window with him on the second floor. Because uh, by that point in time, he was cut off by fire going down the stairs that people came up. So he went over the window and couldn't get the window around. And so he ran over, grabbed the blankets, and uh, just ran and dove out the window backward. Um, unfortunately, when he realized he got down to the ground, he did not have Bobby. And so, of course, the entire community of Lacombe was, you know, it's a horrible tragedy. Uh, 
Um, so they approached City 11 in about getting a piece of fire equipment out there. So if anything like this ever happened again, they'd be able to, to effectively find him and try to give that kid a chance. So um, the City 11 in uh, gave them this uh, Chevy pickup, and so they were actually able to fight fire at that time. Uh, according to some of the older uh, members, there used to be a station, a local station, where this was housed right at the intersection of Meridian and uh, East Cone Road. And it was a cinder block building right there. And that's where they had the original home station. So unfortunately, it was a pretty big tragedy. Uh, and, and the dad ended up pretty severely hurt too. I think it was 40% of the body. So I mean, he did everything he could do. And so <clears throat> speaking of tragedy, <laughs> that's uh, when we took over the air. So when we took over the ambulance, uh, we started responding to the uh, ambulance calls. Uh, in 1967, it was actually a little earlier than that, the, uh, the uh, funeral home used to run the ambulance service here. And it was right out of Houston. And uh, actually, Houston Jones, right where it is today, is where we ran our ambulance service out of. And uh, anyway, uh, it started to get to the point where the call volume was coming up, and Houston was like, eh, I can't really continue to do this anymore. And so he approached the city about something else taking it over. And so the city uh, developed a committee, and uh, they ended up getting a hold of Reed Ambulance that was serving you know, his ambulance service, actually based out. Things were not working so good. Um, I know that one of the final incidents, because it was based a lot on insurance. Do you have insurance? Well, I'll take you in. You don't have insurance? Eh, well, sorry. <clears throat> and so. Um, one story I heard was that a final straw was they had a motorcycle wreck out by the uh, Cascade Drive, Highway 20, or a motorcyclist wreck, broke his leg, and they refused to transform because he didn't have insurance. And so that was it. They are done with the, the company, and they decided that Lebanon will now run the company. And so Chief Paul Robertson took it over. And uh, we ended up getting uh, donations from the Elks Lodge to buy an ambulance. Uh, he was able to put together, together a little bit of money and purchase a van type ambulance. And uh, these three gentlemen here uh, were the initial uh, ambulance attendants. And on the far left is Larry Arnold, who you'll hear about later. Some of you don't already know him. So, um, and it was interesting. I talked to Larry because he ends up being chief. Sorry, it's a word. <laughs> but uh, he said that his first week of working on that ambulance was he had the, the worst call of his career. Uh, and his call was he had, it was out on Grand Street, he said, and it was a car that hit the uh, guardrail. And when it did, it came in and it partially lapped up, amputated this 21-year-old kid's leg. And so they had to try to get him out of the ambulance. He also suffered a pretty significant head injury. He said, so they got him loaded up. And he said at that time, there was no speed limits, no drive with due regard. It was load him up and get him to the hospital as fast as you can. And of course, the Lebanon Hospital is where the library is now. So they would blaze there as fast as they could get there. He said it was not unusual to go 80 miles an hour down Park Street. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so they get to the hospital, and they ring the bell. And they're waiting, they ring the bell. And they wait, and they wait, and they wait for this guy that's not doing so good. And finally, a nurse answers the door. Oh, they just look, let me call the doctor. So the doctor's got to come from home. So the doctor shows up. Well, so Larry and his partner go in there. And uh, the doctor's looking at him. He's like, well, we're going to have to take the leg. And Larry's like, OK, well, that sounds bad. And he goes, oh, no, I need you to help me. And he's like, what? And so he, he holds the guy down as his partner proceeds to turn green and starts throwing up next to him and then exits the room. And uh, anyways, he's like, can't we give him something? Who knows? he's got a head injury. So Oh my gosh. And so I took the leg and he said that was the most dramatic call he had in his entire career for the first week. <laughs> yeah, times were different. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> and so this is just, I, I like this picture because uh, they spent a lot of time maintaining the rigs. They'd strip them down, they put them back together. Uh, that's uh, Paul Robinson there in the mic. But uh, that's Jim Wolf there on the left. You can see he was a big man. Um, 
big hands. So I got a picture later on, as you can see, but just a, a big guy. Uh, one of the stories was is that uh, Harvey Hoff, uh, one of the other firefighters, was on a, uh, a hose line, and he's up the ladder, and he's spraying water on uh, one, of the, like, one of the mill fires. Uh, but anyways, he starts to lose it, and he's going to fall off the ladder. And Jim Wolf walks over, and a two and a half inch line is this big, and it's pressurized. He grabs it, clamps it, and bends it. Stops it. Just, oh, it's just, <laughs> so whether it's legend or whether it's true, I don't know, but it, he was a big guy and it wouldn't surprise me. I'll, I'll, I'll show you a comparison of his hands and compare it to everybody else here a little bit later. But pretty amazing guy. And so this is us doing a little bit of uh, SCBA training. So SCBA started coming in. Um, and it's kind of funny because you always you know, do it the way that we've always done it, which is I don't want to wear one of those things, so it's going to handle me and I can see without it. But it took a while for the fire department to take on wearing air packs. Um, thank goodness that we started doing it because we have learned now that it can cause cancer and all other things that it does. But, uh, but it also allows you to keep a good view of where you're going and, and, and the fire itself. So I uh, have here is one of our, it's probably 1980s, I believe. Yeah, can you tell me better than 80s? Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyways, this is a steel tank. Um, it's heavy. Um, as you can see, it's not built for comfort thin, thin leather strap or thin straps and uh, a little bit cumbersome. And in comparison to what we've gone with today, to give you an idea. Now we have these things here, which are carbon fiber. They don't barely weigh much. They're battery operated. So there's a battery in the back side of this thing that I can literally just pull. Like and they have the alarms built in them? And all the alarms are actually just built right in the pack. So those you actually had to use a separate alarm. So like if you, if you held still for a minute, they alarm. These things, the moment it identifies you're not breathing, it just kicks on, it knows. So, I mean, in terms of technology, we've come a long way. Not only that, but uh, as an incident commander and I'm on scene, I can sit and look at my little computer and see how much air each person has while I'm on scene. So also our masks, so these are the old masks here, and uh, you can see uh, have the rubber backs. I, I remember when I started, we had these, and you always pull hair out when you, when you put them on. <laughs> Whereas now they've gone to... Uh... <laughs> I know that's what I told everybody when I started as training officers. I said, I've now lost enough hair that I can move into that position. <laughs> um, now we've got nice packs, and you can see visibility-wise, they have a full view. I mean, it, 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 it's a big difference in comparison to what we've had in the past. Everything now reads right through here. I can read and see how much air I have on the side. I can read the battery's low. I can read all those things are right here in a heads-up display. So, I mean, things have changed quite a bit from, from uh, where we were. I think about what you also do to our PPE. This is my dad's helmet when he started. I mean, it's, it's a hard hat, essentially. You know, now we have, you know, our full mask with protective gear underneath. They have a, if you were to get hit with something, it's got shock on the inside. So, I mean, what they used to have and what we have now, we could be fortunate. And that's one nice piece about the, the history is that all these previous generations did stuff to help us in the future, you know, as time's gone by. And so, I, it's, that's why I think it's so important, too, that we share the history, because a lot of these guys had to do things for us the harder way. And, and get us to where we are today. And so there's a picture of this is Bruce Parton going in. And this gentleman here, this is Albert Smith. He was tall. He was a tall guy. Um, Bob Berry, one of our uh, current volunteers, has been with us for going on 61 years, said that Albert could just go over to the uh, cross blades on the engine, which most people have to like this, and he'd just go over there and go like this. And grab the loops and go and pull the hose. But, yeah, and so what you see there is he's just got his pack on, a coat, pants, and then he goes to the fire. <clears throat> this is them pulling off Maple Street. They're actually head to a drill. 
And that's why down on the far left. Uh, fighting grass fires. When I first started, that was a lot of fun because you they used to have cages on the front of the rigs, so you can actually sit out there and you put water on the fire that way. Unfortunately, now we got to sit inside the rigs and moves around. It's a little safer, but it was a lot more fun. When we did like <laughs> and so, yeah, they would just be on the outside and, and spray. I mean, it was a good method for putting on grass fire. I mean, it, it did work better than what we do today. Uh, this is when our department finally became a unionized fire department, um, June 29, 1973. Uh, that was led by Larry Hill at the time, who was the union president. And uh, essentially, they, all the firefighters were trying to get degrees. They were starting to become a little more active. They wanted to be unionized and have a comparable wage. And so they unionized. I think it was the first amendment to the city's charter since like 1905. Lots of stuff happened in the 70s. This is when we built our new station. The station we're in currently today. Uh, October 11, 1975 is when we moved into that station. And uh, we've got a whole crowd of folks there. And also in 1975, became a new and so um, the EMT program was initially started by them just communicating out the hospital. And with those relationships made, they were able to get an EMT program going. A lot of them then ended up continuing on to become advanced uh, or uh, paramedics <coughs> at the time. And uh, Dr. Danner, I believe, was a doctor uh, at the time who helped facilitate that. He said, if you get the equipment, we'll get you the training. And so this is what I was talking about with uh, Jim Wolf. On the far left, that's Jim, Captain Jim Wolf at the time. If you look at his hands in comparison to, <laughs> he's not, he's, he was a big man. Uh, Jim uh, Lincolnator, Joe Spencer, uh, Mark Fuller, Larry Arnold, Paul Robertson, Dan Wilkerson. Uh, like not his name. On the top of Sacramento. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> 1976, that's when we got the, the Jaws and Life. And so in the same year, we had our first incident using those. It was actually a mutual aid call with uh, Albany Fire Department. And then the Mustard Team. Uh, this was really, really popular during the late 70s, early 80s. The Mustard Team, they would do multiple events. Um, they'd do the host pole, the host park poles. Um, Was that bucket brigade? Yeah, here's the bucket brigade. And if you actually look at this picture, this is over on 12th Street, right by the station. There was nothing there but farmland. And so this is Albert Smith. Um, he, I think, is the longest lasting member of our department. He was with us for uh, 65 years. And uh, I thought it was interesting. Bob Arias, we were asking Bob about, about Albert. Said, man, Albert was old when I started. <laughs> so he started in uh, 1916. Most of those pictures you see of the three rigs, uh, he's in those as a younger man. So he definitely was a, a dedicated member. Uh, he actually talked about uh, when they had the cannery fire, the big cannery fire in Lebanon. Um, he said that. You actually could sit there and watch the cans. He said it was like fireworks going off. As they were pressurizing and blowing, he said it was just incredible. And he said that fire went in the full city block in seconds once it got on the tar roof and just ran off. He said there was just no stopping it. Uh, he talked about getting a brand new pair of shoes. And then the alarm came on across. And he, of course, ran out of the fire department. They grabbed the hose cart. And off they went running. And he realized he knew his new shoes running through the butt. So, he definitely saw a lot of changes in the fire service. Um, early 70s on, we went through a few chiefs. Uh, uh, Art on the left and uh, Bruce Pickens on the right. Uh, we had a lot of turmoil during that time. Uh, Champion Mill was shutting down, and the union wanted raises, and 
they weren't having to add, there was a lot of, a lot of headbutting. And so one of the uh, city councilmen said, well, you'll get a raise when donkeys fly. <laughs> that was a terrible decision to say, because at the time they were doing the, the donkey basketball. Well, so somebody knows somebody with the donkey, somebody knows somebody with the helicopter. <laughs> so the council meetings, they, uh, they flew a donkey around. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things I remember when I was at Walton Valley as fire chief saying, if you put a group of firemen together long enough, they'll figure anything out. Yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. <laughs> uh, This is just a picture I've always really liked. Uh, it's the Bargain Barn fire in 1982. Um, they had been up all night, and uh, they're enjoying it. Sitting on one of the piles afterward. Um, Ray Fair, uh, Lincolnator, Ron Barber, Ron Lake. Ruben Maricon. Ruben Maricon. An early, early 80s uh, ambulance. Les Townsend, uh, uh, Dana Miner, and Jim Anglin. And then uh, in November 1984, that's when uh, Larry Arnold uh, took over. And uh, at that time, like I said, things were kind of in a turmoil. But when he took over, things started to, to move the right direction. And uh, he did a lot of good things with the department. Um, one of the first things they did was they were able to get a ladder truck, and that was to help of the community. Uh, they had initial funds, but they needed to raise about $50,000. <coughs> and the city banded together and really helped out the fire department, and they were able to get a ladder truck. Which, if you have a ladder truck, you can save city blocks, and uh, that definitely came into play a little bit later. Um, we'll get into that. Uh, July 1, 1987. Um, the department went away from being just solely a city fire department and a rural fire district to combine it to just becoming a district. And so at that point, it became the rural fire district. And those are pretty active. Tim Moore hasn't changed much. <laughs> Right there, she'll recognize that. Right across is 
Big Town Hero. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, and actually, those were there. I always, I always put a picture of you on there. I wish I would have done it now, man. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, pretty significant fire. Um, and uh, I don't believe they ever determined the cause on that. So, yeah. But it ended up taking out an entire city block. And that was one of the largest fires in the And uh, have the old, uh, yeah, the old uh, snorkel that Albany had right here. That was the only one I know of around the area. And John Davis there just any closest. <clears throat> yeah, it's completely, I mean, now you would never know if you had a massive fire there. Uh, this is just another fire showing the uh, different equipment that we were in the 80s. And then Bob and Bruce. So I, I wanted to bring them up. So uh, Bob and Bruce used to do all of our driver training. And so it was kind of well known that Bruce on the right hand side, the guy with five, was the easier going, and then Bob was always the tougher one. And so they kind of good cop, bad cop the driving back and forth as they would train the firefighters. And uh, Bruce was always easy going. If you would let him smoke his pipe in the engine, he's totally fine. You just go ahead and drive. I don't care. Um, so both really good guys, very dedicated, always uh, helping a lot of drivers that got to learn from these two gentlemen. Um, I actually learned from Bob. Uh, Bruce was around more by the time I started, but I, I really enjoyed the Bob. I, you know, definitely made you a good engineer. Bob actually is one that had the closest. Uh, closest uh, brush with uh, death, really, for our fire department that I know of. Uh, he responded, he was at his house, responded with Lane Arnold to a, uh, sorry, I don't know if I'm running you. Uh, to a house fire north of town on Highway 20. And um, when he got there, he borrowed Lane Arnold, who he was with at his house, his coat, because Lane Arnold was the assistant chief at the time. And then, uh, the medic unit showed up and they had, they had an air pack and uh, they had the engineer on the engine and so he threw the air pack on, threw the mask and helmet on, borrowed I believe Mark Fuller's helmet and uh, said he was going to go he's going in, in, in through the front door with, with the nozzle. Well he went only a few steps inside the front door and they used to have one of the old dustbin collectors under the floor and the floor had burned through. So he actually fell through the floor and uh, at the time he wasn't wearing gloves. You know, always learn from response. So that was that was the night, late uh, late 1960s when this happened. And uh, <clears throat> anyways, he realized as he was sliding down, I'm in a really bad spot here. He said he started yelling, and screaming, help, help! You know, I can't, I can't get out because he couldn't back up because it was a metal, essentially a collecting pan. And so he slid down into this. Well, all of a sudden he felt somebody grab his feet, and he said, next thing you know, is he just sees the air. <laughs> and uh, he said one of the one of the firemen grabbed him. They just literally pulled him and they just pulled him out. Well, then when he got out, he realized that his his hands were burned really bad. And he had burns up his arms. Well, Bob's kind of a tough guy, um, and they're like, "Well, we need to take we need to cut the chief's coat off." And he said, "I'm not going to let you cut the chief's coat off. It's expensive." <laughs> so they pull his coat off, and his, of course, his skin goes with it. But he says he goes out to the hospital. He said, uh, "Saw." Uh, But anyways, he said they put some solution on his hands. They wrapped him up. He said, come back in a week. He said, he came back in a week. They took the dressings off. He said, he looked down, and it looked pretty good. He said, it looked terrible, my camera hurt, but oh well, you know. And then he said, uh, can't come back in a month. He wrapped him up, he came back in a month, and he said, everything looked great. I don't know the use, but <clears throat> anyway, uh, so yeah, so he still has, you know, you can still kind of see where he had burned his hands. I had never heard that story. Uh, but yeah, that was a pretty close call. Wow. He said he was always really quick to go to the fire after. They say after that, he hesitated a little bit more. He was always a little bit more cautious. Um, this was one of the, our, our transporting engines. It's something we tried. Um, Chief Perry Palmer uh, wanted to try out. Um, it was essentially this engine was on hydraulics and could lower down and you could load a patient in the back. But, um, it didn't work so good. We tried it. Uh, it was a little heavy. It was a great engine, but the idea of the transporting engine kind of came and died with that particular engine. So um, I think we had two of our biggest guys trying to put up a little guy. 
the back of that engine. That engine just, it just didn't want to work. It was a high lift. And, uh, but it had all what's called a compressed air foam system, so you get lots of foam, you can put lots of fire, it was a good engine. Um, with Perry, we also uh, went out for a fire bond, got a bond past the uh, Villa Police Station out south of town, for response out there, 2008. Um, 2016, we uh, developed the Medic 71 program. That program uh, allowed us to have a medicated chair with all the knee and tangent, and that can help run our calls here locally. And with that, I thank you all for coming. Anybody got any questions that I hope I can answer for you? Thank you. Yeah, You're welcome. I know I was glad. Hold that 
Susan Schultz was the first female full-time firefighter we had. And we brought her on in 1996 along with uh, Kansas City Terrace. And I wasn't there in that time, but I don't believe that there was any significant issue. We also had RVs at the time, two resident volunteers. We had female volunteers before that. Yeah. And so I, I, I wasn't there in that time, but I don't believe, I've never heard of any significant issues that were arising from that. In fact, actually, one well, of our female firefighter, lieutenants, first officer, full time officer, uh, Aaron Hughes, is sitting with us behind you there. Um, you say London's been pretty progressive as far as having women on the department, and we have one of the highest. Women and uh, probably more time to Yeah, that's about half of women that have on the department. Well, one other thing, if you're on your way out, if you just take a look, I brought a bunch of uh, our badges, and there's these little gold ones here. Um, and these were purchased all the way back in the late 1800s. And if you were a good, a good member in standing for seven years, you got a gold exempt badge. And the exempt mean you didn't have to do jury duty. So you're a firefighter. And you didn't have time to sit on jury duty. So, um, anyways, that's what that badge is. I got Paul Robertson's original badge up here. Uh, Crown Zeller back, which is a local village town. Also, we have their, um, their original badge there. And this one right here in the center, that's the oldest fire department badge that we have. So, and that's an original badge from when we started in 1884. So yeah, let's take a look if you want to buy. Anybody else have any questions for me? All right, well thank all of you for coming. I appreciate it.